Today we'll be talking about marine fish, and we'll start with some fish classification. There are approximately 24,000 species of fish, and 15,000 of those are found in the marine environment. They are the oldest vertebrates in the fossil record, and they also have a very large group, so there's quite a bit of diversity there. They all have vertebrae made of either cartilage or bone. They all have gills, and they are aquatic and ectotherm largely ectothermic. So there's several different groups of fish. We mentioned a little bit of this in the um, chordate diversity talk, but just as a reminder, we have the group Agnatha, which is the jawless fish, which com is comprised of hagfish and lampreys. There is the group Nathostomata, which is the jawed fish, and that's going to consist of a subclass of elasmobranchs, so sharks, rays, and skates, and also chimeras and ratfish. And then there's also a superclass called Osteichthys, which is going to be the bony fish group. And here we have two separate classes, one for ray finned fish and one for the lobe finned fish, which, as we mentioned previously, is thought to be the ancestral link between terrestrial and marine organisms. So here's a bit of a um, phylogenetic tree that shows the uh, phylogenetic relationships between these organisms. Now, if we take a look at some of the uh, characteristics of sharks or the elasmobranchs and the osteichthys, so the bony fish, um, the sharks are going to be cartilaginous. And they have what's called, as well as do the bony fish, uh, something called an endoskeleton, which is a framework internally. So their endoskeleton is comprised of cartilage. They have gills that are exposed to the ocean environment, a ventral mouth located, ventral meaning bottom of the organism, so it's located on the bottom of that organism. Uh, they do not have a swim bladder. They do have internal fertilization, and they have placoid scales, which we'll show an image of in a second. For bony fish, they're going to have a bony endoskeleton, so comprised of bones. Their gills are going to have a covering called an operculum. They have a terminal mouth, so it's just at the end of their face as opposed to below. Uh, a swim bladder, which we'll talk about momentarily as well. External fertilization, and then cycloid or uh, stenoid scales. So if we take a closer look at those scales, sharks over here in the bottom right-hand corner have that placoid kind of shape to them, that that makes it so that they're smooth when you touch them one way and sharp and pointy when you touch them the other way to these little spikes there. Um, so if you've ever touched a shark or shark skin, then you'll, you'll have felt that kind of rough in one direction and smooth in the other. Uh, fish can have quite a variety, though. Uh, the other three here are representative of scales from salmon versus, versus bass versus agar. Um, so all of these, though, are going to be slightly overlapping uh, for the most part, except these ganoid scales there, and you'll notice they are devoid of these little sharp pointy bits. If we look at some of the advantages of by each of these groups, having a cartilaginous skeleton makes the cartilaginous fish lighter and allows them to swim faster. They're also more flexible so they can grow larger. Their streamlined body shapes help to reduce drag and then their internal fertilization is going to increase the success rate of them being able to reproduce. So there's quite a few advantages of their characteristics there. For bony fish, the skeleton is fairly light. The bones are going to store phosphate, um, and that's going to be advantageous because it helps them to you know, swim a little bit faster as well. Their operculum is going to be, that covering to their gills, is going to be useful for moving water and allows them to have low activity, so they don't have to uh, continuously, uh, not that all sharks need to continuously move, they have other advantages, uh, but they can just kind of move about that operculum uh, and, and still get water movement across those gills, which is important for maintaining exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, particularly when there's low oxygen levels in the water as compared to the air. Uh, they have a swim bladder that allows them to float in place and also move backwards, and that controls their buoyancy within the water column as well. So it's advantageous to have that swim bladder. If we take a look at some of the gills between uh, a, a lamprey on the left-hand side, a shark in the middle, and a bony fish on the right-hand side, 
you can kind of see that they all generally have a similar kind of structure there with respect to the branching of those gills and the fact that there's a high surface to volume ratio uh, surface area so that they can get uh, a larger exchange of oxygen and benefit more from the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide across that larger surface area. Um, and then you see over on the right hand side that orange kind of coloration is representing that operculum covering those gills. Whereas the sharks are going to be exposed and the lampreys are going to be largely just exposed to the open environment. So um, let's take a look at the economic and ecological importance of fish. So marine fish can serve many purposes economically, both as food and as non-food. In terms of food, fish supply the greatest percentage of the world's proteins to humans. So approximately 15%, although that statistic is slightly older, so it might be even more nowadays. They, approximately 3 billion people, however, depend on food, or, or food coming from the ocean is their primary food source. So, so it is quite important that fish stocks are maintained, as you can imagine, in order to support that large population. Approximately 30% of the fish that are harvested at sea at least in 2006, that that's, number was 30%, uh, are used as non-food purposes. So they can be used as, um, portions of their body can be used as an abrasive. Their bones and whatnot are, are kind of pared down and allows them to be used as adhesive and fertilizer. Parts of fish can be used as jewelry. There's cosmetic applications, some phar pharmaceutical applications, although not many, and then, of course, fish meal and fish oil we've probably all heard of uh, in terms of, in terms of a, a, a common product that we see in our own homes. Um, that link there provides you with some information about how fisheries utilize and make the most out of their catch. So it's kind of interesting because if a fish is not necessarily appropriate to sell for food, then it can have some other use and be sold in some other markets. Within the United States, we have approximately at least in 2016 here, uh, there was approximate estimates of 212 billion sales in different various fur fisheries around, uh, marine fisheries anyway, around the uh, coastal United States waters. And the largest of those kind of sales occur in California with almost 25 billion and Florida with almost 28 billion in sales. But there obviously is, you know, other fisheries that contribute to that total located in the remaining states located on this map. So interesting how there's uh, such a big hub here in California regarding fishery sales. Now, marine fish also serve a very important ecological role, and they're very useful for helping to regulate the food web. They tend to regulate the carbon flux and contribute to approximately 34 to 40% of that, through the process of respiration and excretion. They also help to regulate the sediment processes, so any of that um, kind of storing of carbon and whatnot within sediments is largely due to these fish in, through a process called bioturbation, which is where they're going to move sediment around by mix, either mixing within that sand or having some behavior that allows them to do that. Uh, so if you've seen flounders and other fish that kind of bury themselves under the under the sand as a means of protecting themselves, that contributes to this bioturbation. But there's some fish that just kind of live close to the sediment and naturally, by swimming around, uh, kind of help with that process. They're an active link in ecosystems and often terms, termed bioindicators, which means that if there's something wrong with a fish population, then that's usually a sign that there's something else wrong in the ecosystem. So here's just an example, again, of how that uh, ecosystem processes are, are largely contributed to by fish. Uh, you have your fish that live closer to the surface, so in the epipelagic region that are gonna contribute to respiration and their carbon dioxide's gonna get released into the atmosphere ultimately. Uh, they're also going to defecate, which will result in a mixing of different nutrients and other sinking particles into the ecological processes and the, and the um, various nutrient cycles, nitrogen cycles in particular. 
And then you have your deep consumers, which are fish, which are going to help contribute to that as well. There's also a great diversity within any kind of ecosystem that uh, allows for fish to have various roles. So depending on each ecosystem, you'll have fish that contribute in different ways. So for instance, in San Diego, the San Diego coast, we have a uh, kelp forest kind of ecology that occurs, although there's less kelp forest lately, but <laughs> we do still have some. And, uh, and we've got a nice pretty picture of that Garibaldi, which is the California state fish. And as you can see, there's a huge diversity of, of fish that exist within our San Diego coast. Each of, and each of those exist and occur uh, within the ecosystem and serve a different role or a similar role. But uh, by having a large diversity, you have fish that can specialize in different processes and behaviors and things like that. Additionally, with fish, um, just another note is that within fisheries, that despite the fact that we have quite a large number of fisheries off of California, for instance, um, such as uh, fisheries for California habit, halibut, uh, the spiny lobster and kelp bass, these all actually have different bycatch that occurs as well. So there's different fish that are caught uh, as bycatch, which are unintended for the fisheries, and those either get used for other services purposes or are, um, are unfortunately scrapped. Um, but there's a wide range of habitats that, the, that each of these fisheries can operate in as well. Um, so between the, the variety in those ecosystems and the needs and demands of the uh, economic use of different fish, there's, there's quite a wide variety in terms of um, how that explains why we have almost 25 billion in in um, in sales regarding relating to our fisheries. So let's take a little closer look at fish fish physiology. First, we mentioned that there is something called a swim bladder in these bony fish, but cartilaginous fish have to have a means of being able to sink or I'm sorry, to float and be buoyant within the water column. Cartilaginous fish actually store various lipids in their liver. And lipids are gonna be less dense than seawater. And because of that, it allows them to float within the water column and remain buoyant. Their skeletons are also less dense, so they it contributes to that. Um, now in the bottom figure there, we see an example of a fish bladder with, well, in a diagram there, a fish bladder within a bony fish. This internal organ is a gas-filled structure and it can control the buoyancy and stay at a current, allow the fish to stay at a current water depth. Um, so they have control over the gas that is filled in that chamber and can release that gas in order to um, sink down lower or kind of have it fill up in order to remain a little bit more buoyant. Respiration in cartilaginous fish is going to be something that's important and uh, produces various structures within cartilaginous fish. Sharks and rays have something called a spiracle, which is a hole on the top of the head that draws water in. And also the first pair of their gill slits, located just behind the eyes on the dorsal side of a skate and a ray, is going to be useful for kind of moving water and and pulling water into their system and allowing that fresh water with new oxygen to flow past. This enables them to intake water while the mouth is closed and also while mo most of the body is covered by sand in sharks and rays. So by having that very unique structure to them, it allows them to be able to, as you can see in this figure here, it allows them to draw that water in and continue the, the movement of water across their gills and exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, even when they're sedentary. So uh, there's some sharks that tend to not be able to do this as well. So uh, then others, uh, others have a, a more consistent flow of water across within those spiracles as opposed to some of the larger sharks like the great white or whatnot. So uh, some of those bottom dwelling sharks are gonna be a lot better suited for kind of more of a sedentary and non-movement behaviors. Now, respiration in bony fish is going to occur through a pumping action. 
And that operculum, that covering to their gills, as I mentioned, is going to help control water pressure. They also can alternate between pumping and something called a ram or swimming to make the uh, water move across the gills. So they do have that capability. They can also pull in water across uh, through their mouth. So they have an ability to pull that water in and then the water can move, as you can see in this little figure to the right hand side, in the mouth and then past the, uh, past the gills. So marine vertebrates also, I'm sorry, marine fish also have a very unique nervous system that allows them to form social groups or schools. It allows them to select mates, locate food, avoid predators, um, establish some territory, and navigate through their environment. And they're able to do that through uh, their sight using their eyes. They have hearing and balance, which is kind of controlled by their ears, also by a lateral line organ and a swim bladder. Fish also have a unique sense of smell and taste, which is regulated through something called chemoreception, because uh, smell and taste are, are controlled by chemical, chemical sensing. And they have something called electroreception in sharks. And this allows them to detect small electrical pulses through a structure called the ampullae of Lorenzini. The structures of the lateral line are going to be useful for detecting low frequency vibrations in fish. So in the top part of this panel, we have um, those, those lateral line kind of structures. Uh, the openings in the skin are going to lead to the lateral line sense organs, and that's how they're gonna detect those vibrations. So in these fish, that lateral line is part of a sensory organ. Uh, this is what the structure kind of looks like and that's gonna lead directly to that kind of nervous system. And as you can see, those nerves link down to this lateral line kind of nerve cord so that there's consistency um, or I guess um, more communication amongst all of those little pores. The benefits are gonna be that it avoids collisions and, with, and predators, helps it detect predators, helps it to orient to currents and maintain school positions. Now in the bottom panel here, we have the ampullae of Lorenzini, which is gonna be kind of simpler with the exception of there's gonna be a jelly-filled canal there and those ampullae of Lorenzini are gonna be the structure that's going to receive the signal. Um, this jelly-filled canal is actually gonna amplify it. Um, so a weak electrical pulse can be detected and then amplified by the jelly Collected information is collected by the ampullae of Lorenzini, and then it's transmitted via the nerve cord. So these are located at the head of the animal, and its primary use is locating prey, although it may help in navigation. Now, just a bit here on fish behavior. Most fish are going to use that vision, the lateral line, and their chemoreceptors in order to keep track of one another and maintain unity through a process called schooling. This helps them to protect against predators and aids in the feeding and mating behaviors of these animals. Um, there's a couple different forms that fish can take, and fish schools can take. The metrical distance is gonna be one where there's uh, zones that the fish exist within that are gonna be useful for uh, them being able to have a focal fish and then kind of maintaining equidistance between it. And then in other instances, they have a focal fish and then fish affecting that focal fish, and uh, there being more of a, a random distribution of those fish through a topological distance model. So a couple different ways of schooling. The feeding patterns in fish are diverse as well. Uh, carnivorous predators include organisms like great white sharks, barracudas, and groupers, and they're gonna feed on other organisms. There's also grazers and nibblers, which are going to um, Examples are parrotfish and butterflyfish, and they'll just kind of feed on things opportunistically. Parasitic fish, such as, such as lamprey, are going to attach to another fish and eat the tissue and blood from that organism. Filter fish, filter feeders or strainers, are going to use gill rakers to filter their food. So they have different teeth structures, and that food will accumulate and then is swallowed. So a couple examples are herring, anchovy, basking sharks, and whale sharks. You also have organisms such as whale sharks, which feed by straining small fish and plankton from the water column. We're familiar with them, um, but here's kind of what their 
their structures look like, their mouth structures look like. And then um, in terms of reproduction, there's three different forms of reproduction in fish. There's viviparous form of reproduction, which is where the young are born live, uh, and that includes sharks and rays. There's oviparous form of birth, which is where there's a spot, or sorry, reproduction, which is where there's a spawning of eggs. And this is going to be the most common form. So eggs will just kind of be spawned into the external environment. Most bony fish are going to lay eggs in the millions, um, so they're not protected by the parents, really. Um, and some bony fish in small numbers are going to have parental protection. So you guys all probably remember Finding Nemo and how the clownfish were protecting their eggs there. Finally, we have an ovoviviparous form of reproduction, which is a com combination of the two. So the eggs are kept internal in this form. They hatch before being released, and there's internal fertilization via the male uh, through, a through a structure called claspers. In terms of migration, we uh, do have quite a bit of information on tagging tagged animals, specifically sharks, and uh, I think we're probably most here about great white sharks being tagged and traveling quite far distances. Uh, in fact, a, a lot of the research shows that sharks can travel uh, from northern latitudes where they feed down to southern latitudes where they're thought to reproduce or they do reproduce. So uh, there's, there's those larger kind of scale migrations in some shark species. Uh, there's not a lot that's known regarding migration of, of uh, all shark or bony fish. However, there's pretty well doc good documentation regarding anadromous fish and catadromous fish, which are fish that are going to travel between a saltwater and freshwater environment. Uh, so anadromous fish are born in freshwater and move to the ocean as an adult. They then t return to the freshwater to spawn. So a good example of that would be salmon, uh, a sea lamprey, striped bass, and sturgeon. Catadromous fish are, do the opposite. So they're born in salt water. They move to the fresh water as an adult, interestingly. A good example would be uh, several species of eels. So a couple different behaviors there for our fish. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on marine fish. They are quite a unique group.